Welcome to Sirencester, the unofficial capital of the Cotswolds, and without doubt one of the loveliest and most fascinating towns to be found in this beautiful region of England. On this walk around Sirencester, we'll explore the town's main sites as we stroll through its centuries of history, all the way from its origins as an important Roman settlement to the modern day. But we begin on the town's busy marketplace, surrounded by a wealth of captivating historic buildings. You'll find a vast array of beautiful architecture of many different eras all over Sirencester. But here, we're looking towards the Fleece Inn, a large town centre pub composed of two strikingly different buildings, the black and white timber-framed house dating from the 17th century and the blue Georgian-style house next door dating from the 18th. The pub has been in existence here in Sirencester since as far back as 1651, and it's even thought that it served as a safe haven for none other than the future King Charles II, after his defeat at the Battle of Worcester in that very year, as Oliver Cromwell was cementing his authority over the new Commonwealth of England. Just next door to the Fleece Inn, meanwhile, there stands a more typical Sirencester building, the beautiful stone-built Bingham House, which dates from 1905. Originally designed as a library, Bingham House bears the name of one Daniel George Bingham, born just two streets away from here, and who had a successful career developing the railways of the Netherlands, using part of his fortune to gift a library to his hometown here in England. Later on in our walk, we'll visit the street where Bingham was born, before we make our way to the site of Sirencester's own old railway station on the edge of the town centre. However, it was actually through the very heart of town here that most people passed through Sirencester by road. The town benefited heavily from the 16th to the 20th centuries from passing trade along this main route, which travellers followed when journeying between major regional centres such as Oxford, Bristol, Cheltenham and Gloucester. As a result, many of the buildings that you can see around the marketplace today were built to house shops designed to take advantage of this with everything from small local retailers to large local institutions like the Corn Hall selling to both Sirencester residents and passing travellers, while grand hotels like the King's Head, built in 1860 in its current state, served as a place for weary voyagers to stay for the night. That hotel is actually much older than the one we see today, dating back as far as the 14th century and which historically served as the departure point for intercity stagecoaches in the era before the railways. This was certainly a good place to arrive into or depart from Sirencester, with the marketplace, as the name suggests, home to Sirencester's weekly market, said to be one of the very oldest in England, having been held since before the time of the Doomsday Book over 900 years ago in the shadow of the town's enormously impressive parish church. This is the Church of St John the Baptist, built in the early 12th century, and which stands today as one of the largest parish churches in all of England, notable for its impressive 15th century tower and its unusual porch, the smaller cube-shaped building that stands just in front of the main church. The parish church has stood at the heart of the community as the town has changed around it, and as such, it stands as one of the many symbols of Sirencester, another being the humble hare depicted in this dynamic modern sculpture of 2014 by local Cotswold artist Sophie Ryder. Hares are said to have held a special place in the history of Sirencester ever since the Roman era, a fact which was confirmed just recently in 1971 when a 4th century Roman mosaic was found beside the nearby River Churn, featuring a depiction of a hare. Though that might not seem like anything particularly unusual, the hare in Sirencester's Roman mosaic is indeed special, because most artworks featuring the animals at the time typically depicted hunting scenes, whereas this one is unique in showing the hare simply feeding on grass. We'll talk more broadly about Sirencester's Roman origins in a couple of minutes, but here we're now walking along Castle Street, on which we find a fetching local pub by the name of the Black Horse. Dating from the late 17th century, this historic pub, also located on that main road through town, is a lovely place to stop off for a drink while in town. Though owing to its age and stories of quarrels decades ago, it's also reputed to be haunted. Just next door to the Black Horse, meanwhile, there stands a slightly older 16th century building, 
now home to a newsagent and post office, but which once upon a time formed part of a much larger town centre mansion, belonging to the powerful Vampage family, who held vast lands across parts of Gloucestershire and Worcestershire. Spinning around across the road from those two much older buildings is a row of taller and more modern Victorian buildings, built of that distinctive Cotswold stone, and which today are home to a row of shops, but which once played host to the town's old post office. As you can tell then, Sirencester's town centre is a place which has undergone much change through recent decades, but the historic architecture that gives the town its character has remained very much in situ. Castle Street here in particular, home to a variety of different building styles. Along with commercial establishments like the pub, post office and shops, Castle Street is also home to grand former residences such as this, currently a bank, but which was originally built in 1720 as an extravagant Palladian house for a wealthy local wool merchant. Across the road from the former merchant's mansion is a much smaller building albeit one that dates from roughly the same time, and before serving as the retail space that exists today, it was a humble house, most notably the childhood home of one Kenneth John Beecham, an acclaimed local historian and architect who contributed much to bringing the story of Sirencester to life. With at least 2,000 years of history under its belt, there are plenty of stories to tell about Sirencester, but having now made our way off Castle Street, a good way to get an even better understanding of this town and its spectacular history is to take a look at exactly where you'd find it on a map. As we mentioned, Sirencester is known as the capital of the Cotswolds, being the largest town in this mostly rural region, situated in the southeastern corner of Gloucestershire, roughly equidistant from the major settlements of Gloucester and Swindon. This is a part of England which, while certainly known for its natural beauty in the modern day, has played a vital role in the history of the nation over time. Whether through its close links with the English monarchy in the medieval era, its heritage of wool and textile production, long crucial to the country's economy, or even back when the Romans were sweeping across Britain during their four centuries of occupation. And here on Park Street, you'll find the place where you can learn all about the role that Sirencester played in Roman Britain, during a time when this town was known by the name Corinium. The popular Corinium Museum in front of us here serves more generally as a museum of archaeology, but its principal exhibitions detail the story of Sirencester during the Roman era and even before. There's a wealth of Roman heritage to be found around Sirencester in the modern day, Archaeological finds not just limited to mosaics, but immense landmarks like the huge Roman amphitheatre that you'll find in a park just outside the modern-day Ring Road, one of the largest of its kind in Britain. The amphitheatre was built in the 2nd century AD, and it was so large that it could hold as many as 8,000 spectators, a huge number considering that the population of what was then Corinium was around 10,000. In the 1900 years since, Sirencester's population has doubled to around 20,000, but back in the Roman era, this town was second only in size to London, or Londinium as it was known then. We'll talk more about exactly why Corinium was so big in a moment, but speaking of surprisingly big things, I'd like to direct your attention to the hedge that we can see towering above us here. Built to surround the grand country house known as Sirencester Park, this is the Yew Hedge, which was planted all the way back in 1720, and at a height of over 40 feet, it's said to be the highest hedge in all of Europe, and possibly even the entire world. It's the kind of thing that looks like a nightmare of a gardening chore, but the hedge was deliberately planted to be this high because Sirencester Park, an imposing estate belonging to the historically powerful Earls of Bathurst, is situated so close to the town centre and so it served as an extra security measure on top of the big walls to keep local people out. The building of Sirencester Park here, just a few streets away from the marketplace, was soon followed by the building of many more beautiful Georgian houses, the likes of which we can see here at the top of Park Street, one of a number of winding roads that you might feel is a bit unusual for a former Roman stronghold. The Romans were of course well known for their long, straight roads that traversed countries, and for the rigid grid patterns of their cities. But was that the case in Sirencester? Well, yes it was, 
as the Romans had originally established a fort here around the year 44 AD, just one year after their conquest of Britain began. That fort was only short-lived, however, and after being dismantled in the mid-70s, Corinium evolved into a civilian settlement, serving as the capital of the local tribespeople, the Dobuni, who maintained friendly relations with the Romans. In full, this civilian settlement was known as Corinium Dobunorum, Corinium relating to the nearby river Chern, and Dobunorum relating to the local tribe. As a civilian settlement, Corinium developed the classic grid pattern street layout typical of other Roman towns, gaining grand features including not just the amphitheatre, but an immense basilica and one of the largest fora, or public squares, in all of Roman Britain. Sadly, traces of the old basilica and forum are long gone, but the people of modern-day Sirencester can take pride in a different, but equally impressive place that you'll find just at the end of Cecily Hill the street just across the road from us. This is Sirencester Park, and here we're standing at the very beginning of the spectacular Broad Avenue, an immensely long pathway that runs for five miles across open parkland on the edge of Sirencester, designed to link up three different estates that belong to the Earl Bathurst. Initially, this was for private use, but by 1716, the expansive grounds of Sirencester Park and the adjoining estates were open to the public, and it remains the case to this day, with no less than 3,000 acres available to enjoy. But just outside the park's gates here at the top of Cecily Hill, we find another intriguing landmark in the form of some old Victorian barracks, built in 1857. At first used as a depot and armoury for a local battalion, these impressive castle-style barracks went on to be used as the headquarters of Sirencester's home guard during the Second World War, and then as part of Sirencester College, the local sixth form college who used the building until they moved out in 2013. Nowadays the Cecily Hill barracks are still in use for a number of purposes, and they're certainly worth coming to have a look at particularly with one of the most spectacular parks in England to be seen just a few steps away. If you do come to visit Sirencester, it's a town which offers much more the more you explore it. So as well as looking around the streets of the town centre, remember to venture out towards the amphitheatre and towards the top of Cecily Hill here. Though Sirencester Park is enormous enough that you could spend days rather than hours strolling around it. But as we make our way back through the park gates once again, Let's take in one last view of the mighty Broad Avenue, before we return to Park Street, where we left our main route a couple of minutes ago. Park Street here becomes Thomas Street, another winding road which circumnavigates the town centre, which as we know, has done away with the old Roman grid layout. Later on, we'll talk more about why exactly it was Sirencester that grew to be second only to London in size during the Roman era. But on Thomas Street, you could see evidence of another important part of this town's lengthy heritage. Across the road from us here, there stands one of the largest former wool warehouses in town. Dating from the 17th and 18th centuries, this building served as the main storage facility for a building just around the corner, known as Wool Gatherers, a 17th century mansion that served as the home for a prosperous wool merchant. As we saw back on Castle Street, many of Sirencester's wool merchants spared no expense in showcasing their wealth with grand town centre mansions, the lush natural landscape of the Cotswolds famously conducive to sheep farming and therefore the wool trade through time. Wool was at the very centre of Sirencester's economy for pretty much its entire existence. The 17th, 18th and 19th centuries saw the development of large-scale textiles manufacturing, but the heyday of the local wool trade can actually be dated back to the 13th and 14th centuries. That being said, wool was actually a driving force behind the development of Corinium almost 2,000 years ago back in the Roman era. But as we stroll down the narrow Coxwell Street here, it wasn't just industry that helped Corinium become a Roman stronghold. As we mentioned earlier, the Dobuni, the local tribe, were on friendly terms with the Roman occupiers, having put up little resistance to their initial invasion. In fact, it was because things were so good between the Dobuni and the Romans that the original fort situated here was abandoned, deemed unnecessary. And so over time, as Corinium grew in size and became encircled by defensive walls, 
the Romans could be confident that this civilian settlement would remain stable, even as they fought battles with rebellious Britonic tribes elsewhere around the island. Unfortunately for the Romans, it couldn't stay that way forever, and we'll pick up the story of how Corinium fell later on. But here, we're passing by the town's Baptist church, which was built in 1856, but which interestingly stands on the site of a much older Baptist meeting place, a woman's house where Baptist worshippers began meeting all the way back in the 1650s. It's thought, therefore, that the Baptist church on Coxwell Street here in Sirencester is the site of one of the oldest Baptist sites in England, with origins dating back to the era of the English Civil War. And speaking of the Civil War, opposite the Baptist church we see a fetching yellow-coloured house built in the 17th century, the century of that conflict. It belonged to a man named John Plott, who was a staunch Royalist supporter, a relatively rare find in Sirencester, the town having declared its support for Parliament at the outset of the Civil War in 1642. Sirencester, along with Parliament backing neighbours Bristol and Gloucester, spent the early part of the war blockading the Royalists from expanding their territory into the southwest of England. The Royalists, based at nearby Oxford, needed to get their war in this part of England up and running, and so they set their sights on Sirencester here to break the blockade, the town located close to Oxford and seen as especially desirable owing to its valuable wool trading facilities. In February of 1643, the Royalists launched an attack on Sirencester, led by King Charles I's nephew, Prince Rupert, and it unfolded as an especially violent brawl in the town's streets, with over 300 people killed. The Royalists eventually won out, taking 1,200 parliamentarian prisoners and breaking the blockade. But what about poor old John Plott and his yellow house? Well, despite being a Royalist supporter, his house was looted by the King's soldiers during the battle, and they made off with much of his money. Some bad luck for John Plott there, but his house is one of a number of interesting sites linked to Sirencester's role in the Civil War, and the capture of this town back in 1643 was an important development in the conflict, as news of the Royalist victory here prompted parliamentarian garrisons in many nearby towns to pull out, although Gloucester famously held out in an epic siege, which saw the Royalists fail to take full control of the region. Now, we're strolling down Gosditch Street, which offers some lovely views of the parish church, while also being home to yet more varied buildings. However, one interesting tidbit about Gosditch Street here comes from the story of its own name. In the medieval era, it's said that a branch of the River Churn once flowed along the street where we are now, and it was typically a place where you'd find geese hence the name Gosditch, or a ditch frequented by geese. It seems as if geese were everywhere around medieval Sirencester, particularly because this isn't the only waterfowl-related road name you'll find in town. Sirencester also home to a Gooseacre Lane and Gooseacre Court not far away. The very streets on which the Civil War battle was fought then have a variety of interesting names, the lengthy history of this town playing into the evolution of some unusual monikers which we'll talk more about in a moment. But here in the shadow of the church tower, we find one of the oldest relics in the town centre, Sirencester's medieval high cross, which dates back to at least before the 15th century, and as you can see, it's looking a little worse for wear all these years later. Re-erected here beside the church, the high cross historically stood just around the corner on the marketplace, and served as a landmark for the point where local markets were held which, as we learned earlier, existed since as far back as the 11th century, or possibly even earlier. Wool was, of course, a much-traded commodity at Sirencester's medieval market, and the town's local commerce received a strong boost in the 12th century after King Henry I established a monastery just behind where we are now, next to the parish church, and this helped to ensure the town's status as an important population centre in this part of the country. And this being England, with a lot of people, there followed a lot of pubs, including the centuries-old Crown just beside us here, one of the largest inns in modern-day Sirencester. The Crown, which today incorporates a large beer garden, an upstairs gallery and more within a historic town centre building, stretches along much of this small lane, known by the name Blackjack Street. Much narrower than many of the other main streets in the town centre, Blackjack Street is thought to be one of the oldest in Sirencester, 
and as well as featuring a rather lovely view of the church tower as it looms above the surrounding buildings, it's also home to a number of the town's most popular independent shops and cafes, always popular with visitors. Blackjack Street here was also the street on which Daniel George Bingham, the railway magnate who made his fortune over in the Netherlands, was born. But as with many places in Sirencester, it's the story of Blackjack Street's name which is most interesting. Accordingly, back at the other end of the street by the church, there once stood a statue of St John the Baptist, to whom the parish church is dedicated. And the statue of St John, or Jack for short, is said to have become blackened over time by the soot and smoke which emanated out of the local blacksmiths and other workshops, hence giving the statue and its neighbouring street the name Black Jack. With that statue now long gone, the name Blackjack Street might conjure up images of high-stakes casinos or childhood sweeties. It depends on you, I suppose. But having walked down the historic, narrow lane, we now find ourselves back on Park Street, passing by the Corinium Museum once again. From here, we'll be walking by the mighty Yew Hedge again too, on our way towards the end of our tour of Sirencester, which will finish in just over five minutes by the town's old railway station. But as we've just passed by the Corinium once again, let's return to the tale of Roman Sirencester, which we left off earlier in a time of great prosperity and stability. The roaring local wool trade and the Dobuni tribe's friendly relations with the Romans really playing into the town's development at the time. As you'll no doubt know, however, the good times didn't last forever. So how exactly did Corinium Dobunorum fall? The decline of the once all-powerful Roman Empire led to the abandonment of Britannia around the early 5th century AD, and the great civitas of Corinium was abandoned too. Its grand stone walls, amphitheatre, forum and more all left to decay as the occupiers departed. Now as we mentioned, while there's not much trace of the old forum and basilica that existed in the town centre, Remains of the amphitheatre and some of the old stone walls are still to be found on the outskirts of modern-day Sirencester, as they were used by the native Britons in the years following the Romans' departure from Britain. It's thought that the old amphitheatre soon became a pottery works, while parts of the old walls were eventually incorporated into the later Anglo-Saxon defences around what became Sirencester. Breaking off for a moment from Sirencester's ancient history, Across the road, we're passing by the town's old police station, which nowadays is home to a rather suave showroom by the celebrity designer Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen, who lives locally. The old police station turned design showroom is one of the many nicely repurposed historic buildings to be found in central Sirencester. But just along the road from it, you'll find a reminder of the great medieval defences that once surrounded the town, this point being the west gate in those old walls. The west gate was one of four, or perhaps five, openings in the walls, this one serving the road that approached the town from the direction of Bristol and the coast. As we can see, nothing remains of the historic west gate now, but just beside where it once was, we can see another fetching local pub in the form of the Marlborough Arms, which was opened just across the street from the town's railway station, which began operations back in 1841. The Marlborough Arms remains open today, while the station is long since closed, its old platform now serving as a car park, which we'll see in a few moments. But opposite us here, on the outside of the old west gate, we can see the old museum of Sirencester, opened back in 1856 on the edge of Sirencester Park, and which originally housed the thousands of relics detailing the town's history that are now mostly found in the Corinium Museum a few streets away. Sirencester's centuries or even millennia of history mean that there's a whole lot to talk and learn about when visiting this town, and we've only just scratched the surface of Sirencester's riveting heritage on this walk today. However, we now find ourselves in what might look like a rather uninteresting pay and display car park, but this is actually the site of our last landmark for the day. This is the old station building of what was Sirencester Town Railway Station opened all the way back in 1841, and which, at the peak of the railway era, was one of three stations serving this town. Originally, the station was built as a branch line by the Cheltenham and Great Western Union Railway, who were already building a line linking Cheltenham to Swindon, through which there passed the important Great Western Railway. That line bypassed Sirencester, 
but given the town's size, a branch line connecting to the nearby town of Kemble was built, and trains arrived and departed from here for 123 years, until the station was eventually closed in 1964. For over a century, however, this part of the car park where we are now was where the town station's platforms would have been busy with people and trains day in and day out. And despite the closure of the station nearly 60 years ago now, you could still make out the profile of the platforms and station walls today. Sirencester, once home to three stations, today has none, the nearest being Kemble, about four miles away. But even though you may no longer be able to get here by direct train, don't let that ever put you off coming to visit Sirencester. One of the loveliest towns in the Cotswolds and filled to the brim with centuries of history, a wide array of shops, pubs and restaurants, and plenty of beautiful buildings and open spaces, there's always so much to enjoy on a trip to Sirencester, a real joy if you ever get the chance. Sadly however, it's here that we've reached the end of our walk around splendid Sirencester. Thank you so much for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you're looking forward to visiting Sirencester for yourself sometime soon.